So welcome. So you all saw the uh, presentation this morning, I hope. So now you get to see how we actually did it, all right? Uh, so here's my co-conspirators, and that would be, come on, now you're not working. Come on, let's try it. How come it's not working? Just use the cable. What? Okay, well, yeah, we'll just do that. Okay, so sorry, Verizon, uh, Verizon Legal makes me do that. Um, so I want to introduce you to um, Glenn McGowan and Jason Kett, and why don't you say a few minutes, a few So lines. I'm Glenn McGowan. I've worked on a lot of the uh, integration testing, some of the, the aspects of determining how we want to leverage OpenStack and type of the hardware platform environment, setting up the POCs and, you know, doing some of the, you know, sort of analysis in terms of how, you know, we onboard the, um, the, the white box solution and, you know, some of those other key aspects of employing OpenStack in a non sort of data center environment. Hey, yeah, and my name's Jason Kett. I'm based out of the UK, just outside of London. So I'm part of the product development team for Verizon. So a lot of what I had to do was in developing the product itself, um, the scale, the architecture supporting Glenn around the architecture of the box, and the process is built around delivering the service as well. So it's, it's all well and good as innovating with the device, but the process is to deliver for our customers is just as important as well. That's right. Glenn's responsible for the logo. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, how we did it. So, and, and again, we're going to go into a little bit more about the project goals and objectives and um, the challenges. Um, this is a really hard project. Um, you know, distributing OpenStack, or forget OpenStack, just distributing these types of services over a global network is really darn hard. Um, what I like to s tell people is think of it as like AWX, AWS, except not just in a data center, but like, you know, in a thousand data centers. Um, and they all talk to each other. So that's really, really complex. Um, so that's what we did, massively distributed OpenStack. And, um, and of course, to make it all happen, we had to use a centralized management and orchestration, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, and then how we all put it together. Um, and then finally, we'd like to talk a little bit about where we're going to go with this. And, and also, we believe that there's some uh, ways that the community can, can really work with us to, to take, take some of the things we're doing and really add value in both directions. So with that, um, so first I'm going to talk a little bit about the vision. And um, so network as a service in the real world. So this is really taking, um, as I said, you know, there's infrastructure as a service, applications as a service, now network as a service, and network services as a service specifically. Um, so any network is the idea anywhere in the globe. Um, you know, Verizon's in over 150 countries, and I think Jason personally probably knows the details, the legal details behind all of that. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, our customers all have all sorts of environments, um, and they're big and small. We have customers that are um, using this in very small, you know, maybe 10 uh, deployments, and then customers are looking to roll this out in 10,000 locations. Um, so very, um, very different types of architectures, and we want to we wanted to make it as flexible as possible to support those different architectures. Um, we're also moving, um, you know, just the comp the company and the world is moving toward a consumption based use model. So the idea is that customers will be able to stand up kiosks, you know, for a couple months during the Christmas season, and then take them down and use these services. Um, on that sort of ad hoc basis. So with that, um, so there's obviously a lot of challenges to building this product. And uh, so I want to turn to uh, Glenn to talk a little bit about, um, you know, why OpenStack? Yeah, so one of the things that we constantly struggle with in, in any sort of, you know, carrier environment is the ubiquitous uh, infiltration of vendors. And I'm trying to look at the back of the room because there's a lot in here that are just staring at me. So um, 
I'm going to try to stay on point. But one of the things the vendors are good about is, is selling their ecosystem, right? So they have kind of their own strategies in terms of roping you into their ecosystem. And what OpenStack really provides for us is sort of a, a pure uh, intent, right? It, it's only there to sort of fulfill the needs of the community. And so some of our needs were OpenStack is developed for sort of a you know, data center environment, but there's some challenges that exist within the data center or there's some opportunities that exist in a data center environment that we can move out of that data center and, and move it to the customer prem. So one of the things that we liked about that was with a little bit of you know, sort of innovation, we can take what OpenStack does in sort of a, you know, a walled-in garden and maybe export that in a connected way out to the customer prem. So what, what we sort of envision is a single you know, pane or a, a, an orchestration plane where we can run VNFs and be able to literally drag and drop them you know, wherever a, a customer sees fit. For example, we may be running in a cloud type of scenario where a customer may have a router function or some sort of LAN optimization function running in the cloud and all they have at their customer prem is just some basic you know, connectivity equipment for providing some sort of layer one, layer two connectivity. Yeah. And we do processing there. But maybe some of our larger companies have data centers of their own and maybe it's not practical to run some of these services in a data center environment. So we would want to sort of bring that to the premise. But we don't want to create, you know, by doing that, we don't want to like, you know, create a situation where we create a little island, right? We would expect to be able to sort of extend our cloud to, to that premise, not, not break it and create another mini cloud, but just extend our cloud. So one of the things that OpenStack provided for us was, was that capability. And there's still some challenges there that we'll probably cover in some of the future aspects of what we you know, yep. think that you know, we need to address. But the time being, you know, there, was, there was a lot of work that was done in the OpenStack community that kind of enabled us to be able to realize this uh, capability. And with that, we're able to sort of say, okay, no Mr. Vendor or no you know, XYZ, this is kind of the trajectory we want. And what that ended up happening was we saw something that was really incredible. For the first time, we were able to then define the framework for you know, sort of where we wanted to go versus sort of a vendor kind of you know, pushing us in a particular direction. We were able to take OpenStack and say, okay, this is the framework. Now, what can you guys do to help us enable that? And so we worked with a number of vendors to, to onboard VNFs. You know, yep. There were some vendors that you know, really weren't familiar with the whole OpenStack concept. Uh, but through you know, some very close relationships, we were able to sort of cultivate that. And you know, as, as a community, which include the carrier and its vendors, were able to grow. And it felt like we were in a little bit more control of, of, that, of that process. Right. So let's talk about massively distributed OpenStack, <laughs> which is. Um, and again, Glenn. <laughs> I feel like I'm getting all the work here. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> so the product architecture itself kind of follows the, the OpenStack model, where I just talked about, you know, the, we want a sort of, you know, ubiquitous cloud experience within the Verizon footprint. So like I said, I, we don't want to create little islands. We don't want to sell a product to a customer and say, okay, um, here's your cloud product, and then <laughs> For some reason, they want to move you know, a call center or some sort of data center to another location. We'd say, OK, we're going to have to disconnect that service in this cloud and spin it up in this cloud. That, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us. So from a product standpoint, we had to really integrate OpenStack and our, our real kind of vision for how we wanted to implement OpenStack across the board. So in, in that process, you know, the ecosystem that we establish is not based on islands that we've you know, kind of separated out and we call that the cloud, right? The cloud, in, in terms of at least the way we would want to define it, is a true cloud. You know, everything is connected to everything else. It's, you know, it's, it's massively distributed, multiple layers of control, um, autonomy, uh, the ability to just move functions where we see fit, see fit, when we see fit, and how we see fit. So let's talk about the technical solution. So. So we have all these little components all over the place. We have the orchestrator, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, we have the network services where they're needed, as Glenn said. Um, and this is what we started with. So back of the napkin, or actually in this case some... Uh, that's some, it, that's college rolled. Um, co college mm, rolled. Yeah. Uh, We're sophisticated in Verizon. We use notebook paper. <laughs> yeah, we use notebook paper. Um, and then we, we turned that into... Um, 
a system that really logically has, you know, hosted services, the edge, edge connector, you know, the edge boxes, all in different combinations. And we, of course, had to add the, um, the classic, you know, the, the, the customer existing conditions. Because this is not a green field. I mean, these are customers that already are connected. They already have firewall services. They all have all those services. And so this is, this is a migration um, and next generation type model. So we needed to incorporate that right into the product, the ability to do that migration, uh, which I know something as OpenStack thought of a little later <laughs> in the process. So you want to talk about that or should I? Or? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'll jump in. So yeah, so, <laughs> so we started off with our VCP, our global hosted network service solution. So this is our data center infrastructure, which we've deployed across the globe today. And so this has been built from the ground up specifically to support network functions and network services. And we took that concept into the white box functionality. And I guess I draw your attention to the, to the gray box at the bottom, the, the x86 hardware components. What we've got here in the table here is just one of a series of the family that we've been working with. So there's going to be a range of platforms available to our customers and our enterprise customers because their needs are based around the amount of VNFs they want to support on a single device, the size of those VNFs, and those needs and those sizings are also driven by the vendors we work with too. So our partners and vendors have got different sets of requirements for us based on the x86 resources, be it, be it the amount of cores each one needs to spin up, the amount of RAM, the amount of disk. So we've, we've got a family of devices which will be coming out as part of the, uh, the open uh, sorry, as part of the, the white box architecture. And one thing I would add there is, um, you know, our, our vendor relationships were, were critical to this piece as well. You know, I, I come from the IT organizations within Verizon, and we are certainly capable of developing our own sort of in-house open source solutions. We even had kind of our own prototypes running. And, uh, you know, one thing that you have to think about is, you know, version management, you know, who's going to do all the patching? Who's going to do all of these things that are going to be required for managing sort of uh, a complete in-house solution? And so through the process of working with our vendors, we came up with, you know, the mechanisms that, you know, you see here um, that we think are, uh, you know, kind of best in breed. And interesting as well is, you know, it, it doesn't, it, you know, we can open the door to as many vendors as we want, and we can even then eventually support or bring your own model where customers can consume this service on, on their devices that they want. So that's why we try to draw this differentiation between the top line. I guess another interesting thing as well, I guess, Glenn, is that we've managed to get a lot of this resource the OpenStack elements, fast packet processing, or the Linux base, the hypervisor base, all on the small unit here, we've managed to get all of that into a core right. with one of the partners we've been working with. So that's, that's an interesting right. point to raise as well. Yeah, and I want to talk about that for a little bit. Um, I did mention in the keynote. Um, so, you know, this box goes out on a customer site, and the value to the customer is not particularly the infrastructure, or the OpenStack, or the hypervisor, or any of that stuff. The value to the customer is the is the network functions like the firewalls and the WAN optimizers and other functions that are sitting on this box. So we want to optimize the, the amount of space that's devoted, the resources on this box that's devoted to services that our customers want. And we really wanted to, to make sure that the, not, not that, that we were stinting the OpenStack, we wanted to, it obviously needs to work, um, but we want it to be as optimal as possible. And I guess another key point as well, you know, this is a five, six hundred dollar box. You know, so what we're doing is we're enabling our customers to get involved in this innovation and get involved in this new technology. You know, if you think about the old model, they'd have to spend two, three thousand, four, five thousand dollars on a piece of CPE device, which they'd hang on to for a large period of time. You know, this is, this is a device that can get entry to this type of technology immediately at low cost as well. So. That's right. I think something else is that uh, it gives us the ability to not just give the customer entry, but it gives us entry as well. Right. So maybe, you know, as, as VNF and even SDN start to mature, there may be use cases that we have not, you know, sort of thought up yet. So we have the capability sitting out there in an x86 platform, a, a white box, this one just happens to be literally white. I think, Jason, you wanted to make it white, right? We made it white on purpose, yeah. I was, yeah. was Chad. Because most yeah. of our boxes are black, and they're like, where's the white box? I'm like, that's it. No, well, it's we black. Could, we couldn't stand up here and say, here's never our mind. white box, and it's black. So. Yeah, yeah. So the whole, it's like, you know, never mind. Marketing. So, think marketing. Yeah, those, <laughs> they don't know anything. Um, so we, we, we really think that, you know, with this sitting out there, we have the ability to 
you know, sort of on the fly orchestrate any type of solution uh, going forward. It's just getting, getting sort of that adoption pushed all the way out to the edge and, you know, building out the infrastructure. This to me, maybe not, you know, maybe, you know, from a, from a product standpoint, but for me, at least from a, uh, a systems perspective or, you know, uh, an engineering perspective, this represents plumbing, right? So we're able to plumb out, you know, our different customer locations. And I think with this device here, we're starting with that. We're able to plumb yeah. them out. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, just a little bit about the data center design itself. So I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time because um, other than uh, we, we did some things un unique related to the fact that it was a, a network. Um, as you said, it's designed for high performance networking, but the reality is inside we, we did something fairly, fairly standard, you know, a leaf and spine uh, normal type um, environment. Again, it was really focused more outward looking in the WAN environment, which is what really counted for us. So we wanted that low latency um, and high performance networking experience that our customers want from, uh, from us. And remember, we're using this for our internal uh, applications as well. So it's not just for customer facing uh, applications. So you want to talk about the WAN technology? Yeah, so that? Verizon has many different networks. You know, we, we sort, certainly, you know, we have one network, but when you start looking at the different functions that are associated with each network, you really sort of come up with these three different type of environments. We have a public internet uh, network, and then we have a various private networks. And then, of course, we have to manage all of the devices that we have in, in sort of a, a separate management network. Yeah, and, the, and these are millions of devices. So. That's right, yeah. I mean, so we, you know, we've, we've got an entire, you know, army of, of devices out there, and they're all serving sort of different functions. But with what we're able to do with OpenStack and the network and infrastructure that we've built, we can basically create an overlay on top of those networks, which are, you know, they're just kind of a means to an end or the plumbing. But once we're able to sort of overlay those three networks, we really get to a true cloud type of environment. So I think what we're saying is, is once you've, you've got your, your cloud layer, you make that a ubiquitous layer, you stop doing these little island type configurations. And then that cloud layer, if you look at it, is superimposed on top of your different networks that you have. And so what you end up at the end of the day is sort of a very um, you know, vanilla uh, cloud environment that can pretty much accept, you know, any type of VNF, or we would want it to accept any type of VNF and any at location. any sort of network configuration. Yeah, yeah. And, at any and location it's a WAN, globally. It's a WAN. Yeah, that, that's the real key. I mean, I think most cloud vendors traditionally have, you know, it's very data center centric, and you don't necessarily hook the data centers, they're sort of islands unto themselves. But we haven't done that. We've we've really extended out and We're, have a a single. Yeah, we're very big on SD WAN technology, um, and you can kind of see where you know we're we're kind of bringing that sort of SD WAN type of environment into our, our internal network, where you know we can sort of build a, a a common network cloud as opposed to just a compute cloud. Right. So that's kind of the, the duality there that we're looking to accomplish. Yep. Um, and, and then, of course, we can talk a little bit more about the cloud management. Um, that's really the key to it because, you know, any kind of telecom is going to be very, very concerned with efficient delivery of services, right? So we've automated the hell out of things. I mean, this is no secret um, because that's the way you have to do it. Um, and so this cloud management network that we've created, and this, it's, it's consolidated, but it's all running through our ticketing systems, all our back-end operation systems, which are all highly automated. So uh, you want to talk a little bit about this? Or this is just, this is just some, um, a little bit about uh, some of the, some of the back-end systems we did for the unified fabric. Um, and then we have same, same with the storage. Uh, don't want to spend a huge amount of time on it because it's, um, I don't personally think it's all that interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but what you get down to is the orchestration for the, for the virtual network services product, which is, of course, just part of, our, uh, of the Verizon strategy. Um, the orchestration is really the key to making it work. Um, and uh, so orchestration, uh, what, what we did is we really forced the vendors, uh, we literally um, got the vendors to talk 
and, and some of them is, these are vendors that aren't, aren't necessarily, I mean, some, and some of them are competitors. Um, but we had to have them talk to each other because they had to talk to the orchestrator and they had to talk to the, to, uh, you know, just, just for the integration. Um, and, and that's something that is sorely needed and it, it's the only way it can work in, in, in the telecom world. <clears throat> um, so we also, you want to talk a little bit more about this? Or? Yeah, so orchestration is, is really the challenge. You know, you, you have a, a cloud um, and you have, you know, the network, the underlying, I guess, underlay network that supports that cloud. How do you, how do you stitch all of that together? How do you link that together in, in a way that's cohesive and efficient? And so that's where orchestration comes in is, you know, we've, we have the capabilities to be able to realize and identify you know, what network configuration points we have, how to deal with them, um, how to configure them, um, but also how do we hook that up into the virtual space within the cloud compute areas? And so the orchestration environments are, are very critical to that because they provide that stitching across those different domains, whether it be a network domain or a compute domain. Um, there's also the closed loop assurance aspects where, you know, we can monitor the health of, of the, the VNFs that are running in the consp uh, compute space, recover them, you know, do, you know, service assurance things like, um, you know, reporting, um, you know, failure conditions and that sort of stuff. And we're able to stitch those and do a, you know, end-to-end -end sort of correlation, not only within the compute stack, but also within the networking stack so that we have a full end-to-end -end view. So for us, it's not just, you know, compute for OpenStack. It's also we have that sort of underlying underlay network that we also have to kind of bring up into... Uh, focus and, and manage it all as a unit, and that's what the purpose of orchestration for us is. Yeah, and we have our orchestration expert in the front row here if you want to ask him some questions. <laughs> yeah, drag him up here. <laughs> Great. Just to put you on the spot, Russ. <laughs> uh, so, um, and the other thing, of course, is that orchestration really um, uh, drives, uh, another aspect of it is a lot of our customers want high availability. So they're used to having networks with, um, you know, I think it's officially our SLA is five nines, but they, in reality, they expect six or eight or nine or basically 100%. Um, and, and, you know, the only way to do it is using the orchestration platform and, and the analytics to, to detect the fault and then, then bring up the new service, whether it be out at the edge or within the, within the cloud environment. The analytics are very key because it kind of gives us uh, a, uh, an insight into how the customer is using the service, how the network itself is performing, um, how we are utilizing our network in terms of capacity planning. Um, and that goes not only because of you know, what we're trying to achieve with you know, unifying the network layer and the compute layer, how is the, that compute using the network and how is the network using the compute and establishing those relationships through those analytics? And then you know, kind of you know, uh, putting that data together, doing some you know, pretty deep analysis and coming up with the correlations that we need to make the right decisions for um, the, the path forward. Yep. And I think what we're trying to show here, I guess, is how important OpenStack is in our overall architecture. You know, we've got, if you like, three layers in this diagram. We've got orchestration at the top, Glenn's just been talking about. We've got the cloud layer in the middle. And then we've got the white box, we've got the universal CPEs at the edge. And in each of these areas, orchestration is a key component. It's what stitches the entire network and the entire ecosystem together. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an important part of the fabric. Right. And we're using the OpenStack APIs to do it. So, so OpenStack is um, you know, key to making this all work. Anything else on that? No, I think one thing that I would like to point out is you see that OpenStack control is running there. So one of the challenges that you know, we ran into with OpenStack and, and that is not a problem in the data center environment is um, you know, you've got control and compute all sitting in the same relative uh, area within you know, a physical data center. So you don't have to worry about you know, control uh, separation issues between your compute and your control. So one of the things that we looked at initially was, okay, can we put control inside the device itself? So we create control and compute in the same box. And um, you know that was that was a, you know some some one of the harder things that we had to do, and some of the decisions that we had to make is because when you put control in the box on a little machine like this, resources become you know uh, an issue because now you have to factor. Okay, this is a four-core machine. How many cores am I using for data plane? How many cores am I using for management? Uh, my controller is going to take up some of that for you know the things that it does for the control stuff. 
Compute's going to take up some of that. Data plane's going to take up a little bit more of that. So the, the, the model that we're looking at right now is to keep control in the device. And what that does is it's going to prevent the, the issues that you see you know, other carriers you know, describe uh, and the challenges that they've identified in terms of startup storming and, and those sorts of things. So by putting control there, what we plan to do is do a sort of a multi-layered uh, controller approach where uh, we've got you know, tri-circle running and, and ever-increasing levels to where we can link our efficiently link our OpenStack environments into a single cloud. So at the highest layer, you've got control, a single controller. We'll call it an Uber controller or whatever you want to call it, but it's a single controller that has underneath it these, all of these different you know, sub-layered uh, federated controllers. Yeah. We've looked at technologies like TriCircle. There's a couple other projects that are doing that, but the most promising one that you know, we've seen so far is TriCircle, and we'd like to try to figure out um, ways of, of making that happen. And, and in reality, that's, that's the direction that we're going today. Yep. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit. Do you want to talk about this, or should I? No, you can talk about this one. <laughs> <laughs> I, this is the diagram I drew. <laughs> um, so I want to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, automation workflow. This is, and this is actually from the customer perspective that we're looking at the workflow. So the customer puts in an order, or the customer puts in an order to the account manager, either one. And then it goes into um, the portal, actually. And then in the case of a universal CP, we ship it out. Um, and then it powers up, and then it reports its active status back. Um, and then that's in the middle is the zero touch provisioning, and that then pulls pulls down the uh, you know whatever the customer ordered, um, and then sets 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 it up. And then there's some you know again automated testing, and then the service is turned up. Um, we also have um, and that's what happens at the universal CP on the edge. Um, and then of course it's much simpler. Um, uh, if it's if it's within you know within our hosted environment um, because you don't have to ship anything to anybody, um, and then the bottom process is the process that happens if the customer already has the universal CP and they want to make some changes to their uh, or add add a VM or take it away or whatever, and that bottom process is what happens when when they want to do that as well. But I guess the key thing as well here is you know part of innovating the process is. You know, two, two numbers I can throw at you here, three days. That's the time with the target we're, we're, we're imposing on invoice comes in or the, the order comes into our, our white box manufacturer to getting it on the customer's side. Right. If you think about the old world model, that was, you know, that's a, that's a week's, that's a month's process. You know, three days, that's a challenge, that's a target. Right. And then the ZTP, you know, we want these things spun off in literally 15 to 20 minutes, no more than that. So that's another key target as well, where we're trying to innovate with the process as well as just the technology too. So they're, they're, right. they're key things to be aware of. Uh, and, and another thing is that we don't want to have the images, pre you can preload the images on the VM, I mean, on the box, but you don't want to do that. There's a number of reasons for that. One, no, the customers aren't necessarily going to buy all the images. And two, there's some, there's some legal regulation and regulatory things with boundaries, you know, cross-country boundaries. Export compliance. Yeah, ex <laughs> export compliance. And, and again, Verizon is, has to take into consideration all sorts of legal and regulatory things that, you know, a lot of people don't have to think about. Um, but poor Jason has spent the last, what, six months <laughs> yeah. working on all those export compliance things and, and not putting the image on here and just, just downloading it that gets around a whole lot of those issues. Um, so just want to uh, kind of put it all together. And um, so we're going to open and we're going to allow some time for some questions as well. Um, so this is the slide that um, we had this morning. Um, but again, we put, put all these services together and really um, put together an architecture that allows customers to really put together what they and consume what they want. Um, and we have some built some automated tools to help them uh, architect um, appropriate services. I know we have a little calculator that, that says what fits on what box. Uh, we have some uh, tools that we've built into our um, sales um, thing. I think you saw a little bit of that this morning that gives optimum, you know, suggested and recommended um, solutions. That was for the specific box, but we also have some suggested architectures for based on what customers want. 
Um, and this is, this is just the overall, um, you know, all the different, the overall framework. Um, what you can see is right now we're, we have four services, um, but the framework allows us to add additional services as, as the needs um, arise and, you know, and as customers ask for additional services. So uh, in the, in the um, you know, we, we implemented the ones the customers asked for the most, which security is probably <laughs> number one by, by a factor of 10. Um, but uh, we have others and, you know, cons customers are constantly asking, well, can you support this? Can you support that? So we have the framework to really add that. And it's really just a matter of going to the vendor and saying, well, if you have a virtual image and you can support OpenStack and you can tie into these APIs, let's have a conversation. And um, here's just some slides from the um, uh, customer, you know, so we've created this portal, which you saw this morning. Uh, this is just some uh, screenshots from the portal. So one of the things that we're really wanting to do is, is bring the customer in to understanding how they utilize their service, how, what control they're going to have over their service. And so we're really putting a heavy emphasis on our portal capabilities. Um, you know, working with our customers to, you know, kind of educate them on, look, you have control over your network. You have control over your compute. And so as you saw in the keynote this, this morning, you know, Beth had went through um, a demo of, of the portal that, you know, we're working on now. And um, in, as you saw, you know, the customer has complete control. They can go into their, uh, to their network. They can, you know, uh, increase their, their throughputs. They can decrease their throughputs. They can add or remove service level features. They can do... Um, anything they want, um, uh, or we would hope our goal With is to allow rails. them to do anything they want. <laughs> no, uh, anything it, that they can. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Want. So it's 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 the direction that we're going is is enabling the customer and empowering the customer to have control over that. I mean, I, uh, I, uh, me being a technical guy, there's there's got to be customers sitting out there that are are technical as well that are so frustrated by the fact that you know they've got to work through you know. Uh, various levels of sales and you know product support teams and things like that to just you know I just I just want to increase speed I, or I just want to add this particular feature why should that take me two or three days why do I have to go through a quote process and things like that I just navigate to the side I click a button and then within you know a couple seconds I, I've got what I needed so we think that's very powerful and if you link all of that together with you know sort of the the framework that we've created with OpenStack um, the stitching we're doing with our network, um, and this, you know, this, this, this scenario here, this, this, uh, this capability here, we're in control. Um, we're able to um, allow our customers to, to, to take that control whenever they need to take that control. Um, in terms of vendors, because of the framework that we've built, we can snap vendors in and out of our framework in any way uh, that we yeah. want. If, if there's a particular technology that we don't like, with the framework that we've built, we can remove it, or we can go with a different technology. We're, we're very flexible. Yep. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the future and also open it up to questions. You, you actually mentioned some of this stuff already. Yeah, so um, the, the, the current challenge today that at least I see with, you know, kind of OpenStack in general today is, is out in the customer spaces, we're dealing with, you know, METH, the METH, uh, Metro Ethernet Forum type of environments where we're doing VLAN switching, PBIT priority, um, all of those things that are associated with, you know, customer OAM functions and that sort of, that sort of detail. Where OpenStack sort of lacks in those environments is that capability. And we've seen the ML2 extensions utilized and, you know, there's been some efforts to sort of create plugins that can augment OpenStack. But in reality, OpenStack at the end of the day is still geared more towards a sort of data center environment. And as you heard in the keynotes um, you know, this morning, there's, there's a, a large amount of complexity that's involved with OpenStack, and we don't really want to add to that complexity, but there should be instances where we can um, you know, uh, have our cake and eat it too, where we can enhance you know, um, OpenStack in a way that will allow us to seamlessly deploy that uh, in, in the network or in, in, a, in a customer premise-based uh, environment, which doesn't require us to go in and build plugins or these, you know, complicated ML2 extensions that are just sort of abstracted or, you know, hollow um, um, capabilities uh, to support what we actually need support. Yeah. 
Did you want to add anything? Should we open it to questions? Let's open it to questions. Yeah. Okay, I'd like to open it to questions. <laughs> check, check. <laughs> so one of the benefits we all enjoy about OpenStack is that normalization of API, right? You've got normalization for Neutron, for Nova, for heat templates, your VNF lifecycle management, et cetera. Uh, and down to a lot of the, the lower level OS stuff, you can find Yang models for just about anything. NetConf manage, and some of the vendors in that space provide that too. Uh, not, not as many as you'd think, as, <laughs> as we are finding. <laughs> Agreed. So going up a level in the stack, and I'm sure you're contending with this already, there's no standardization, let alone even normalization, like uh, NetConf Yang or anything like yeah. that. How are you tackling the VNF vendors themselves? Yeah. Because again, if you want that build your own, bring your own, you know, you would eventually want to evolve something where like open daylight or something like that could solve that. Yeah, so that's a good question. And you're right. I mean, that, that is the, the top of our stack as well. And you mentioned NetConf Yang. We're looking at Tosca models as well. And one of the, one of the, the things that are critical to the evolution, just with what has to be this year, is sort of pushing our vendors in that direction. So we're coming up with a portal to do just that, where we would say, OK, Mr. Vendor, um, if you want to sell or you want to you know, bring um, your technology into our network, you've got to go through this sort of process. So they would be able to upload their images into our portal. Um, they would have to provide some sort of you know, standard template in terms of a Tosca model or a Yang model so that we can you know, understand all the different um, you know, uh, elements or uh, details that are associated with, with that. And then our ideal situation, and this is what we're working on internally, is the ability for our automation and orchestration platform to evaluate all of those different inputs and spit out maybe an initial um, uh, you know, decision on whether this vendor needs more work or whether, hey, they're ready to go. You know, let's move them automatically to the next you know, um, cycle, and we can start you know, sort of that onboarding process. Gotcha. That's so, why I mentioned net company. Yeah. 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 The, it's also an answer, by the way. Uh, the MEF and all the lower layer, the yeah. underlay stuff, NetConf and Yang. Yeah, yeah. Is the answer to that. Well, yeah. so your NetConf, I, I, I would disagree in that, you know, we would, we would stick more with the Yang side and maybe the Tosca model side. NetConf Yang, you know, is something that's being pushed on maybe the, uh, some of the other equipment vendor uh, sides where you've got them, you know, sort of trying to standardize on NetConf. But it's not happening, right? We still have some vendors that are standing out, standardizing on NetConf. Others are not. Some of them are just you know, saying, no, I've got my own REST API, and I'm going to stick with that. Or I've got a controller that has a REST API. You guys don't worry about that. So we're still contending with that. Where I think I, what I understood your question was is how do we create sort of a normalized layer of VNFs that we're going to spin up in a, 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 a compute environment. Normalized uh, APIs for yeah. actually putting yes. the payload configs yeah. on that's right. rules, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's one of the reasons that we... That's the stuff that customers are interested in. Exactly. Right. There, there's, I, I, we're, there's not going to be a ring to rule all the vendors. Every vendor is going to think that they have, you know, sort of their solution. And so what we have internally to sort of combat that is, you know, we've, we've taken the approach of normalizing everything north of our orchestration and platform and into our IT and OSS BSS systems, there are, is there's a single standard API there. And then we have that translation layer that plugs in all the different vendor differences. So we can try to push that further down the stack as much as possible, and that's what our current objectives are. Don't forget yeah. you have the customers and the money. Yes, yeah. that's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. That helps. Yep. So next question. Check. Yeah, so there's been a lot of vendor interoperability discussion from the Verizon backend perspective, but what is being done or how does this open up vendor interoperability at the front end user, like the final customer's level like mine, whether it's a virtual operator like Comcast or a competition like Sprint, how do they become interoperable? Um, so we, there, we have to be careful when, when you say that, right? Because um, when we, we develop an API. We wouldn't necessarily develop an API that would allow them to interact with the equipment directly, right? Because that could create situations where we're running into out of sync conditions, where there may be some policy management and security things that you know, we're not you know, keeping track of. So the best way to do that, at least in our opinion, is to set up you know, a common API for just the purposes of customers where they can come in and influence those environments yeah. through our orchestration stack. That way we maintain that 
that level of you know synchronization we can we can sort of you know kind of control the the, the customer experience because in, in to your point every vendor is going to have sort of a different API potentially and what we would want is not to say okay customer you ordered a Cisco solution or you ordered a Juniper solution or you know a, a, a Fujitsu solution these are the three or four different APIs for each one of those solutions. I, I don't think you as a customer, you'd be like, I, I don't want this. I want one API that would control my three or four different vendors. And the only way for us to really offer that is to kind of bring that through you know, a, a common API that's filtered through our orchestration platforms. Yeah. Good. And next question over here. Hindsight being 2020, <laughs> with respect to OpenStack, if yeah. you did this process all over again, what is something you would do differently and why? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think I think what we would probably want to do differently is um, yeah, that's a tough question. <laughs> well, I can tell you uh, is something to, that would yeah. make the process more efficient. Uh, more. I tell well, you. The, so the one thing the, that I that I don't like about OpenStack is its complexity. And the one thing that you know kind of brought us to bear was heat. Right, heat was kind of our, our saving grace. So I guess one thing that I could say is that we were kind of late in the late adoption phase for yeah. heat. And once we were able to bring in heat, then we started to realize that there's ways to sort of, you know, rule all of those different OpenStack uh, services with one heat. And that goes back to the gentleman's point and the, the other gentleman's point about having a single API. Heat represents that single API, at least from an OpenStack perspective, within kind of the Verizon space. Yeah, and, and I'll add, um, we were a little late to the game. So Verizon, you know, I've been involved in the, my personal, I've been personally involved in OpenStack for about six years, but Verizon as a company played around for a couple of years before it really, you know, took it to heart. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think we should have built up the expertise sooner than we did. Um, I'd say if, if I had to do it all over again, definitely. <laughs> I think she took a shot at me. I'm not sure what that means. It wasn't him. <laughs> it wasn't you. <laughs> next, next question over here. Hi there. Uh, you mentioned uh, your orchestration platform and the complexities of orchestrating at the edge. You also mentioned HOSPA compliance a couple of times. But what actual orchestrator are you guys using? So it's, we, we have, we, what we do is we break up into service orchestration and resource orchestration. So at the service layer, it's all homegrown. It's, you know, we understand our product, we understand how to, you know, sort of create that service chain, um, how to stitch it together within what we call the service orchestrator. And then what we have is a resource orchestration layer. And that resource orchestration layer is what I was talking about a few moments ago where we would kind of plug in the different vendor differences into that. That, that is the resource orchestration layer. And that vendor today is Ericsson. So we, we bought an Ericsson uh, solution. Um, they're providing that layer of abstraction for us and then they offer us an API up to our northbound facing um, service orchestrator so that, you know, as technology changes, and knock on wood, I, I, Jason and I were just talking about this, you know, last night, um, that I, I'm kind of a pessimist. I, I, I don't, I don't want to put all of my eggs in the OpenStack basket. I don't want to put all of my eggs in a particular vendor basket. I want, at least from a Verizon standpoint, for, you know, for, you know, future scalability is for us to maintain some sort of generic component as much as possible. And by going with that Ericsson orchestrator from a resource orchestration standpoint, we that's help us achieve that goal in a very short, short amount of time. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I think everything's over. Is that correct? Well, we, get, we can take, yeah. we can take, we got time for one more. All right. One more question. <laughs> Hi. Um, so you have all three open right? stack that are distributed, okay, and then you construct, uh, you construct a, a global view. And my question is, uh, how do you construct, do, build that global view? Are you using something that is centralized, such as TriCycle? Yeah, TriCycle is, yeah. is, the, is, is the one that I'm most interested at this point in, in using that. I think there's a couple other projects that are out there as well um, that would do that. But yes, TriCycle is, is kind of the top of the pile right now. Yeah. Okay, so I guess next step is to decentralize Recycle? That's right. Well, okay, so <laughs> that was a trick question. <laughs> Make so, sure it works. <laughs> so at least the way I would want to happen is, you know, it's, it's not just, you know, controller to controller. It would be controller to controller to controller. 
So maybe like quad cy cycle or some circle. It's so it's multiple layers of a tricircle type of control environment. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. Thank you.